Two weeks ago, we began this new series on the book of Romans, and we began by examining the dramatic impact that the, the book of Romans has had on, um, on the world, especially Christian history, but even world history as well. We looked at a number of uh, individuals throughout the last couple of thousand years who have been in- incredibly impacted by the, the book of Romans, uh, Augustine, Luther, John Wesley, people whose lives were transformed when they when they began to study this book, and from that came some of the most significant movements um, throughout Christian history. And we, we talked about the reason that, that Romans has made such a dramatic impact upon people's lives is that Roman, the, the Gospel of Rome, or the, what is the Gospel of Romans? The, the, the letter called Romans unpacks the Gospel. And we looked at how the, the word gospel simply means good news. And when Paul uses it, he's referring to the good news about a person, the good news about Jesus, how he came to this world, he died upon the cross, was buried, and then rose again. Now, this gospel of Jesus, we talked about how it is powerful. But not just any sort of powerful, it's the power of God powerful. Okay? And our key text, we, we looked at in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, which says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. The power of God, and that's the reason for the title of this, of this series to be the power of God. Now, in our first uh, message, the, the first title was But Now. And we looked at the first major truth that we see throughout the, the book of Romans, and that is that without the gospel, without Jesus... The world is helplessly and hopelessly lost in sin. Paul goes to great lengths, and really the the large amount of the first three chapters of Romans unveils this, that we are all sinners, that we all deserve death. Um, There's this judgment down, um, God has a day of judgment in the future, and all of us deserve condemnation on that day. Without the gospel, there is no way of escape. Religion can't save us. Prayer can't save us. Knowledge can't save us. Um, your law keeping, regardless of how good you are, you, you think you are at keeping the law, that can't save you. No matter how hard we, we try, we fall, all fall short. And we finished our message with those two words, which I said were my favorite two words in the, in the book of Romans, but now. And the effect of, of those words when you, when you read them in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 21, is kind of like, those dramatic shifts that you see in, in movies. Maybe it's, it's towards the end and suddenly someone comes riding in, galloping on the back of a horse, or someone bursts into a room where a wedding is going on and says, I object. There's, a, there's this dramatic entrance that flips everything upside down. And with those two words, but now, we see Paul introduces the gospel. He introduces Jesus. And there's this dramatic shift where the gospel turns everything upside down, this helpless, hopeless situation that we find ourselves in is completely changed. As a result of this, there are seven, as a result of this but now of the gospel, there are seven wonderful truths that we see flowing out of, of, this, of this message. Um, you'll see them on the screen. I won't read through them all um, right now, but these are the seven messages that we're going to unpack over the rest of the series. And the one we're up to today is the next major thing, and really is, this is at the, the heart of the book of Romans, is the topic justified by faith. So that's our message today. But now, because of Jesus, because of the gospel, we are justified by faith. Now, in the book of Romans, there's a lot of technical terms that, that Paul uses, and justification is certainly one of those. So before we talk about how we are justified, it'd be better to have a bit of time thinking about What does the word justification actually mean? And before I give you a a, uh, a written definition, I want to give you more of a story definition and share a couple of stories in the Bible that that kind of um, illustrate to us what this this word justification means. The first one is the one you see here on the the screen. The the man on the left there is Joseph, and um, many of you would be familiar with the story of Joseph. Joseph... Uh, when he was growing up, his brothers hated him. They were jealous of him. And as a result of that, they threw him, uh, they sold him as a slave. He went down to Egypt. Joseph went down as a slave. And then things got worse. He found himself in prison. 
Now, when Joseph was there in prison, he encountered two men who were important officials of Pharaoh's, uh, from Pharaoh's palace. One was the cupbearer, and another one was a baker. And these two were there in prison, and um, as the story goes, both of those were received a very um, significant dream from God. And the dream was symbolic, it was cryptic, and so they were sharing this with, with Joseph, and God had given Joseph the ability to interpret um, dreams, and so Joseph shared with them the meaning of those dreams, and he said to them, to, to the cupbearer, in three days, um, Pharaoh will, will call you to, into his presence, and you will be restored to your position that you had before. Whereas the baker, um, Joseph said, in three days, you will be called in before Pharaoh, and you will be killed. And so the story goes, exactly that very thing happens. Pharaoh's birthday came uh, three days later, and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff. He summoned first his, his chief cupbearer and, and on the chief breaker to join the other officials. So they brought him before the king. What's going to happen? He then restored the chief cupbearer to his former position. Okay? Back to where he was before he went down to prison. So he could, could again hand Pharaoh his cup. The Pharaoh impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had predicted when he interpreted the dream. So here we have two individuals with very different verdicts that are handed to them. In fact, opposite verdicts are handed to them. The first one is an unfavorable verdict. Okay, he's judged as guilty. He's punished. And this experience, which the baker experienced, you, you could call this the experience of condemnation. Well, on the, other, the opposite of this is what happens to the cupbearer. He receives a favorable verdict from the king. He's judged worthy. He's judged to be innocent. And he is restored to the position he had before he ever got into the troubled situation that he was. So the first one, the experience is condemnation. The second one, we can call this experience justification. So the first thing I want you to know about justification is that justification is the opposite of condemnation. Let's unpack it a bit more. So justification so is the opposite of condemnation. It, is, it means to receive a favorable verdict. It, another word for justification is the word acquittal. It means to be declared not guilty, declared innocent, or using the word that Paul likes to use in the, in the book of Romans. Justification means to be declared righteous. It means to be forgiven. And one of the, word, one of the way that... Um, has been used to help people remember what justification means. Justification means to be treated just as if you never sinned in the first place. It means to be restored to a right standing, to a right relationship before God. Let me share with you another story from the Bible that illustrates uh, justification. And this is the story that we often refer to as the story of the prodigal son. In this story, we find a father with two sons, and one of them begins to have feelings of ungratefulness towards his father and, and uh, feelings of impatience. And he, one day he looks around at his property and he sees that uh, one day he's going to inherit all of this from his father, but he thinks, I don't want to wait until uh, my father dies to inherit this. And so he comes up with this crazy idea and he goes to his father and says, Dad, can you please give me my inheritance today? Now, in doing this, he was, he was practically saying, Dad, I like your stuff more than I like you. I'd prefer for you to be dead. And this would have come across very um, offensive towards his father. But the father goes along with this and, 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 and gives the land to his son. And the son gets this. And then he goes off into a foreign land. He takes all that money with him. And he, um, he wastes it on wild living. And when he's, his money is starting to dry up, there's a crisis in that land. and There's a famine. And this is when the situation turns very bad for this, young, this, this son. And he finds himself at completely rock bottom. And he's there and he's thinking back to what he once used to have with his father. And he thinks of all the mistakes that he made along the way. And how there's no way that his father would ever want to have him back in his presence again. But for some reason he thinks, I'm going to go give it a go. I'm going to go back to my father and see if he will even just take me back as one of his servants. So he makes this long journey back to his father and he gets there and his father looks out and he sees his son and his father runs towards where his son is. Now at this moment, 
the father has two options of how he can respond to this son that has been so reckless. Firstly, the father could respond with condemnation. He could say, why did you do this? You've offended your family. I never want to see you again. You're dead to me. That would be responding with, with, with condemnation. But instead, the father chooses to take the much harder path, the graceful path, the forgiving path, and says, welcome back as a, as a son to my family. This is the, the experience of justification. And I like this story because sometimes when we think of justification, we think of it in, sort of in, in cold legal sort of terminology, in, in a, as, a, as a, um, something that's sort of not very personal, it's transactional. But I like this story because it puts the, the idea of justification in warm, loving, relational terms. In this story, justification looks like that warm embrace from the Father. Justification looks like those kisses, that affirmation. It looks like forgiveness. It looks like, let's celebrate my son has returned. The Father completely restores the son back to the position that he had before he ever walked away. The son is treated just as if he had never sinned. This is the experience of justification. And so often we find ourselves feeling like I'm sure that young man did on the way back to his father. Unworthy. We feel like sometimes a disappointment. People are disappointed in us. We stuff up. We do things that we regret. Sometimes we just outright hurt people. But I want you to imagine having an experience like the one that you see on the screen. Imagine standing before God and having him look at you and treat you as though you are someone that is completely worthy. Someone who is completely innocent. Imagine having God come to you and wrap those loving arms around you and say, Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. The good news is that because of the gospel, this can be our experience. It can be our experience in the future, and it can also be our experience today. So the key question that we're looking at today is how can I be justified before God? Let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 to 22. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 to 22. Now Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 is, is really a summary of the main point that Paul has been trying to make up to this, 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 this part. And this is what we were... Uh, where we finished on in the last message. And it says in verse 20, and I want you to look for this word, that word justification. It says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So we looked at how God has this standard, and it's called his law. The, 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 the way that he wants us to live. And this is saying that it doesn't matter how hard we in our own strengths try to, to be obedient, try to follow God's requirements of us, we are always going to fall short. And through that way, through this relationship with the law, through our efforts, our, our attempts to be law keepers, to, be, to live right lives, this is saying that pathway will never result in your justification. Because, as it's going to go on to say shortly, all have sinned and fallen short. Verse 22. Here's those, those critical two words. Sorry, verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. In other words, this is saying, God has provided for us a new way to be right before him, separate to our keeping of the law. There's a new pathway, that, a new door that has opened up. Uh, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. And this is saying, this is, this is a new way, but really it's the way that God has been pointing forward to all throughout the Old Testament. Um, verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith. Now there's those two critical words. Through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. And we see this in, in, in great clarity when we come down to verse uh, 28. And it says, um, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. What this is communicating to us is that 
the gospel has opened up for us a new pathway towards justification. Previously, it had been the law, but this new pathway is by faith. Now, last weekend, I went on a hiking trip with the Pathfinders on what they call Expedition. Um, and if you're new to Pathfinders, Pathfinders is just a, a program that we run at our church uh, for young people, and we do, they do campouts and all sorts of exciting things. And so the group, and there's probably quite a few here that were on this Pathfinder trip, the group that I was a part of was the A hikers. And so there's different grades depending on which, how difficult you want your hike to be. And A hike is the hike that you do um, if you want to be, do, just be bashing through spiky vines and going off almost cliffs and all the really, the sort of places you would never choose to walk through normally. And in this area, there's lots of, um, there's lots of roads that go around the place. But what they do when they plan the A hikes, they say, you know what, we could go on that, walk, on that road, but let's go through that thick, um, steep section where no one has ever gone before. And so that's what we all seem like what we're doing on, on the A hike. And, and so we spent the days um, bashing through with getting cuts and scratches and having a wonderful time doing it, uh, in the, um, doing the hiking. Now, it got to the last day. And the person who uh, was one of the people in charge came to us and they gave us our coordinates which outlined the path we were to go on on this, this final day's walk. And we looked at it and there was two uh, quite large valleys that we had to walk through. And the person who gave them to us said, now I haven't actually walked through that section yet, um, so I'm not quite sure what you're going to find, but uh, hopefully you get back within not too late at the end of the day. So, we went in there thinking, what are, they, where, what are we going to discover when we go on this part of the hike? So we get there and we start going down these, these two valleys and up the, the two other sides of the valley. And as we're going through, every now and then we'd come across these cliffs that sort of be hidden in the bush. You, they were small enough that you wouldn't notice them on the map. And you would think you'd have like a compass set and you, and you, you have the path that you're wanting to go. But then you come across this cliff and you think, there's no way I can get up to that cliff. And you'd walk left and right and this cliff would just go along until eventually you'd find a little break in the cliff and you could sort of scramble up and, and um, continue on your way. Now I remember, I think it was, yeah, it was as we're going up the second of those two valleys, um, our fearless leader, Randall, was leading the way and we got to this spot that just looked like it was going to be really difficult for us to, um, to get through. Now, uh, Randall is a tall guy with long arms and long legs and, and he managed to scramble up to the top of this, this, this steep section but when we look, looked at all the other kids that were in our group, some of the kids were pretty short, and they had these big packs on, and so we were able to throw the packs up, but still, their little arms and little legs weren't really quite long enough to, to reach some of those holds that they needed to. So Randall came up with an idea. Instead of them climbing up themselves, he reached out his hand from the top and said, just grab my hand and hold on. And so they'd come and they would reach up and grab onto his hand and... Up, they'd be pulled up the cliff, and the legs would be slipping on the rocks, and as long as they stayed holding onto Randall's hand, they would make it to the top. It wasn't really probably as dangerous as it sounds like, but um, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make, get across to you is in this moment, there was two very different approaches that we could have had to making it safely to the top. We could just trust in our own uh, abilities and climbing skills, even though the arms were little and the legs were short. <laughs> Or we could reach out and take hold of that hand and hold on tight. And I think this illustrates the two different approaches that Paul is trying to convey to us in the book of Romans. The first way to find justification is through our own efforts. But Paul has made it very clear that we always fall short of that. It doesn't matter how long our arms and legs are, it doesn't matter how much strength we put into it, we're always going to fall short. But what Paul is saying is that there is another way. And Jesus has reached out that big, strong hand and he's extended it to us. And the response of faith looks like reaching your hand back up to God, taking hold of Jesus' hand and allowing him to do what you could not do for yourself. I love a, uh, there's a definition of faith here in uh, a great book called Patriarchs and Prophets by uh, the author Ellen White. And it says this, 
Faith is the hand by which the soul takes hold upon the divine offers of grace and mercy. Do you like that? What a great definition of faith. Faith is the hand of the soul that reaches out and clings on to God. And as long as we hold on tight, he will never let us go. As we go, th- as we go through this section, there's, there's three truths that when we talk about righteousness, justification by faith, there's three things that Paul really seems to want to emphasize about justification. And the first one is this. Justification is, firstly, a gift. Let's go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So this justification is a gift. Now this is a radical thought in the, the landscape of religion around the world. The majority of other religions, when it comes to how can someone become right with God, it all has to do with your performance. You have to obey right. You have to think right. You have to serve right. You have to perform right. And if you do all the right things, then you will earn yourself a right status before God. Whereas what Paul is saying is that what the gospel has done for us is something wholly different to that. It's not based upon our own performance, but justification is something that is a free gift that God has extended to us. So justification is a gift. Not only is it a gift, but it's only a gift. In other words, it's something that we can't actually contribute to. Let's continue reading some passages from this section, general section in Romans. Romans chapter 4 and verse 4 to 5, it says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. In other words, they're saying, as soon as you work for something, what you're getting, you're getting wages, you're getting things that you earn. A gift is not a gift if you have to contribute something to it. I remember back when I was a kid, um, well, we still get a lot of these, these phone calls from telemarketers. And I remember my mum got this phone call from this telemarketer, and the person on the phone said, Congratulations, you have won a free booklet. Your number has been randomly selected to win a free booklet of coupons. And mum was like, oh, that sounds pretty good. And they went through, and some of these coupons are really good. For example, the local pizza store, there was a coupon that allowed you to get a free pizza every single month for the next year. Great gift, isn't it? And so my mum was getting excited. I think there was some, some holiday things in there as well. And, and this booklet was a gift, they said. And mum said, okay, I would love it. Um, send it through. And at the end of the conversation, the telemarketer said, okay, now, to get this, there's an administration fee of, I think it was 90 or $100 or something like this. What happened to the gift? It's a gift with a small little contribution. And I think sometimes when we, when we, think, of our, uh, when we think of justification and how can we write with God, we say, yes, it's a gift, as long as you contribute whatever it might be to that gift. As long as you... You pray hard enough and you love, hard, love well enough and you, you, you do enough for God and you, you go to church on the right days and you do all these things and you somewhat give that little administration fee, then you can have the gift of, of uh, justification. But what Paul is saying is, is that, that someone who works and gets wages is not a gift. But the person who does not work and does not contribute That is what a gift is. And so justification comes to us as a gift and only as a gift. Now, the third thing about justification that we see here is that justification is a contradicting reality. Okay, This is something that I think we sometimes find difficult. Justification is a contradicting reality. Let's look at Romans chapter 4 and read verse 5 again. It says, And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, His faith is counted as righteousness. Now, I love that phrase, who justifies the ungodly. Is that not a contradiction of terms? Justification means to declare that they are righteous, declare that they are innocent. And this is saying that God is doing this to people who are ungodly. Or some of your translation might say people who are wicked. 
Isn't that a contradiction of realities? How can someone be both in reality before God righteous and then also sinful? How can that be? Well, I think it's, it's in many ways similar to Jesus when he was upon the cross. When Jesus was on the cross, was he innocent or was he sinful? Innocent? Okay, so from one perspective, Jesus was innocent. He had never done anything wrong his whole life. But the sins of the world had been applied to his name. So from another reality, Jesus was considered and treated as though he was a sinner. See that, that contradict, almost that contradicting reality there? Jesus was, and you think about when, when Jesus was interacting with, with, um, with um, Nicodemus, and he says, and he reminded them of this story back in the Old Testament, just as the serpent was lifted up on the pole, so will, Jesus, so will the Son of Man, so will Jesus be lifted up upon the cross. The serpent is a symbol of sin. How can Jesus be represented as a symbol of sin? Well, the sins of the world were applied to his name. And so when someone is, justification, is justified by faith, there is that, con, uh, that contradicting reality. From one perspective, they're a sinner. They've done uh, wrong things in the past, and in the future, they're going to continue to make mistakes. But from God's perspective, they are, uh, the righteousness of Christ is applied to their name, and they were treated as if they had never done anything wrong. What a beautiful uh, thing that is for us to wrap, try to wrap our minds around. Martin Luther came up with a, a Latin phrase, uh, which, which, was, which is um, one of the famous sort of phrases that he had, which was to try to describe this reality. Simul justus et peccato. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly or not, but it means at the same time righteous and sinful. And this is part of the reality of being justified by faith. So justification is a gift, it's only a gift, and there's that contradicting reality that we, that we have there. And we'll, we'll, we'll be unpacking that further as we go through the book of Romans. So what does the faith that results in justification look like? Let's go to Romans chapter 4 and read the first three verses. It says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, for if Abraham was justified by works, he is something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. What Paul is saying here is that if you want to understand what this, right, this justification by faith looks like, we need to go back to the story of Abraham. And I think that he chose Abraham because when you go through rumors, there's this real sort of, Paul is trying to show that Jews and Gentiles are alike um, under sin and, and, need, and can be saved through faith. And so he goes to the great patriarch of the Jews, which is Abraham himself. And he shows how this was the very method through which he experienced justification as well. So the story of Abraham. So Abraham, when we find Abraham first in, well, his name was originally Abram in Genesis chapter 12. And at this stage in the story, he's already pretty old. Okay, Him and his, and his wife, they're old. They're, they're well past the age of, of bearing children, and um, Sarah, he, his wife, is, is barren, is unable, has never been able to have kids. And God comes up and gives this, this promise in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said, said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's house, the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So here comes God to this man who's well past the age of having children, his wife's well past the age of children, and says, I'm God, I've got a promise for you. I'm going to set you apart, and from you will come a great nation, and this nation will go on to bless the world. Huge promises. And Abraham responds with, sure. <laughs> okay, I believe you. And so Abraham goes and he walks to this land uh, that God had um, told him where, where he was supposed to go. And, but the time begins to pass and there's still no child. And he begins to question God. I'm um, God, so how am I going to have a nation that comes from me that blesses the world if I don't have any children? And so God 
takes him outside. It says he took him outside in Genesis chapter 15 and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. Have you ever tried to do that? A lot of stars in the sky. Um, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Imagine if you're hearing this. This seems to contradict reality. How on earth, when I look up at the stars, could that ever be my reality? But, Paul, but, sorry, but Abraham chooses not to trust in what he sees, not to trust in what he feels, but he reaches out that hand of faith and he says, takes hold of that promise and he says, God, I believe you. And in response to this, in Genesis 15 verse 6, it says, Abram believed the Lord. There's that faith. There's that extension of faith. And it says, and he, that's God, credited it to him as righteousness. There's justification. Because he reached that hand out of faith and took hold of the promises of God, God applied a perfect record, really applied the righteousness of Christ to Abraham's name. There's that faith. But the story continues on. And the years continue to, to go past. How is this going to be fulfilled? Now, there were some shaky moments in Abraham's experience. There were some times when he took let go of that hand and he tried to sort these promises out in his own, in his own ways. But then God would show up to him and once again, he'd say, okay, God, once again, I entrust myself to that promise and I'm going to cling to you. 25 years later, and along comes this little son by the name of Isaac. God's promises came true for Abraham. But is this where faith ended for Abraham? In fact, it only got harder. God shows up to Abraham and he says, I want you to go for a hike. I want you to get that son of yours, that promised son through which we're going to bless the nations. And I want you to take him up a mountain. And up on top of that mountain, I want you to do something which might seem quite strange. I want you to sacrifice that son. I want you to kill that son upon the mountain. And so Abraham, in obedience, goes up and he gets the, the, the wood and the knife and, the, and he gets his son and they climb the mountain. He goes up, he builds the altar, he sets the wood, he, he ties his son up and places him upon, um, upon the altar. And he raises, just imagine what was going through Abraham's mind at this time. He raises that knife. Here is the son through whom the nations are going to be blessed. And here he is about to follow God and to kill that son. And what was going through his mind? Now, the rest of the story finishes. God calls out and, and well, the voice comes down and says, stop, stop, stop. And there's this ram in, in the bushes and, and he didn't have to go through with that. But I want to give you a little insight into what was going through Abraham's mind as he was about to sacrifice his son. We find this in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17. It says, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Just see the, the, the contradiction there. I'm killing this son that God has promised is going to bring about this great multitude of nations and bless the world. This is what Abraham was thinking. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life once again. Isn't that an amazing exercise of faith there? He got, Abraham has reached out his hand and he's taken hold of God's promises so strongly that he realizes even if it doesn't make any sense, I'm going to follow God and I'm going to believe in his promises and I'm going to believe that his promises are true. Even if God has to raise this son of mine back up from the dead, I will continue to cling to that hand um, of, of God. The faith of Abraham was a persistent belief in the promises of God, even when they seemed to contradict reality. Romans chapter 4 and verse 18. Let's bring this story of Abraham home for us today. It says this, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offering be. He did not weaken in faith, but when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. So here was this contradiction. Abraham, from an earthly perspective, there's no way he was ever going to be the father of a nation. 
but he did not waver in faith, even though he was 100 years old, and even though his wife had never had a child, but he clung in faith. Verse 20, No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Here we go. There's our, another definition of faith there. Faith is reaching out and taking hold of the promises of God. It's being fully convinced that God is able to do what he has promised. Verse 22. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Then it says, But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who was raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord. So the justification of Abraham is a model for us today. God had promised that he would, through him, the world would be blessed. And really, this was the promise of Jesus. Through Abraham would come this one descendant who would come to this world, live a perfect life, die upon the cross, be raised again, and through that, bring blessing and hope to the world. And when Abraham was believing in that, those promises of God, he was through that actually believing in the promise of a future Messiah. And in that way, his faith is exactly the same as the faith that we have today when we put our faith and we take hold of Jesus, the one who came and lived and died and was raised for us. Abraham reached out in faith, took hold of the promises of God, and God gifted him in return. He gifted to him by applying to his name the perfect life of Jesus. And when we reach out and take hold of the promises of God and we take hold of Jesus, the same thing is done for us. God looks down and he gifts us, he applies to our name, the perfect life of Jesus. Now how does this impact us today? Two short verses for us. First one is found in uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. And the first way is that because of this, we have peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this, is, this certainly includes peace from God, but it's not just a feeling of peace that it's talking about here. This is that we are relationally at peace with God. We're no longer enemies with God. We have a right standing before God. Friends, if you have put your trust and belief in Jesus, that's your reality. You don't have to question whether you're right with God, but you can believe the promise that we have here, that if we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. The second thing we have is hope for the future. And we see that in, the, in verse 2. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And that's the hope of eternal life. That's the hope of when Jesus comes back that we will be taken to be with him forever. All of that is ours through faith. Father in heaven, God, we are so unworthy of all that you give us. To think of um, just what we see here in the book of Romans, that all have sinned, and Lord, we know that to be true in our lives. But we thank you that you didn't just abandon us to that hopeless, helpless situation. Thank you, God, Father God, for sending Jesus to this world. I thank you that there's that great but now, Lord, there's that dramatic um, interruption in history where everything was turned upside down through the gospel. Thank you that now you offer a justification to us as a gift. And Lord, today, as we've ticked the little boxes on our cards, Lord, we've said, Lord, we recognize that we can't do it ourselves. We recognize we can't contribute to our justification, through our right standing with you. But Lord, we reach out our hand of faith and we take hand, hold of the promise that you are the God who justifies the ungodly. And so with that, Lord, I pray that, that you'll help us to go out with that peace in our hearts, knowing that we have a right standing with you and that we have the assurance of a great hope before us. Thank you so much. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.